Hi everyone. Well, many of you have reached out to me asking me to do an update on the Washington Bridge project located in Rhode Island because of the closure of the westbound bridge suddenly back in mid-December 2023. And there's been a lot of new developments, so I'm going to bring you up to speed and let you know how I think this is all going to turn out. And spoiler alert, I really feel for the people of Providence and East Providence who have to commute across this bridge every day. You know, Rhode Island DOT has opened up additional lanes by cramming them into the eastbound bridge. And uh, I understand that the slowdowns have improved a little bit. There's not as lengthy as they once were, but it's still a huge impact on the local communities there. So let's start with the big news that came out last week. Rhode Island DOT issued two requests for proposals. One was for demolition of the westbound bridge and the other was to design and build its replacement. And guess what? They got no contractor, no designers, no interest whatsoever, and nobody responded. There were only a handful of questions uh, that were asked, and uh, people were asking for extension of time or to have a meeting to discuss the whole RFP process, which Rhode Island DOT refused to do. So they really made their bed. Now there are many aspects as to why essentially Rhode Island DOT and the state government in Rhode Island have essentially poisoned the well in terms of getting anybody interested in being involved with any major project like this for Rhode Island DOT. And in particular, because of all the political uh, pressure and attention brought to bear on the replacement of the westbound bridge for Washington Bridge, Nobody's gonna to touch it with a 10 foot pole apparently. Now, Rhode Island DOT estimated that the cost of the design and replacement of this bridge was gonna be around $300 million. And uh, originally I estimated maybe 200 million, and then I upped it to 300 million, and then many of you said that the cost is gonna be far greater, which I, I believe at this point, given how poorly this has been handled by Rhode Island DOT. DOT tried to entice people to bid on this bridge replacement project by offering early completion bonuses and given the aggressive schedule, I think it's likely that many people concluded that they wouldn't be collecting any bonuses and they would be lucky to minimize the delay damages that would be assessed. So it's, it's a kind of a poison pill project. Who, who would wanna take that on? Well, apparently nobody. Now there was a successful award for the demolition of the existing westbound bridge and that went to Etna Bridge. And uh, I'll come back to these folks later in the context of they're likely to be sued. The state of Rhode Island is going after consultants and contractors who have previously been involved with the Washington Bridge Project. And again, I'm gonna go over the details associated with that. But at 45 million, uh, Etna Bridge could potentially make another 3 million, so $48 million in incentive pay. Rhode Island DOT's estimate for the cost of the demolition was $30 million. So the actual costs are over 50% above what Rhode Island DOT had estimated. So Again, not a very uh, good indication of the ability of Rhode Island DOT to administer these kind of projects. Now, I mentioned the lawsuits. Back in April, Governor McKee and Alviti were at a press conference and Governor McKee announced that the day of reckoning would come to those involved in the lead up to the emergency closure of the Washington Bridge. So to that end, Governor McKee made an arrangement with two private law firms to join together and go after contractors and engineering consultants who have previously been involved with the Washington Bridge Project. Now these law firms are reportedly working under a contingency fee arrangement, so they would get 16.67% of any damage awards that came to the state of Rhode Island as a result of these lawsuits. Now these two law firms are Wisto and Savage, you see a picture of the two principals there, Wisto's on the right. He gave a press conference. Well, both of them gave a press conference yesterday. Wisto did most of the talking, and I'm going to cover some key aspects of that press conference. But they sent out letters to multiple contractors and engineers, and I've got a link in the description where a local media source has posted all of these letters online, so you can go through it yourself. So I was wondering, you know, why did they pick a private firm to go after individuals or companies involved with a public project. So presumably the state of Rhode Island would have an attorney general who could go after 
individuals and companies who they thought was responsible for the emergency closure of the Washington Bridge. But again, it went to this private firm. And make no mistake about it, I mean, the reason why these lawyers are going after all these engineering consultants and contractors, for their part, they, they want to get money. I mean, if the replacement costs, let's say they're $500 million right now, I mean, they're looking to make over $83 million here. And all the while, if the state of Rhode Island is suing all these people who have previously been involved with Washington Bridge, that provides a lot of political cover to the McKee administration and the state of Rhode Island indirectly. So, so the problem though, is that when you have the local pool of contractors who've already been involved with this project, all in, in all likelihood facing major lawsuits with potential of millions of dollars of award damages if, if a jury goes that way, it's just gonna run everybody off. Nobody in their right mind's gonna wanna get involved with the replacement bridge project for Washington Bridge. So I guess they went with uh, Wisto and Savage because Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe must have been unavailable. Now let's play this segment from this press conference yesterday and you'll hear Wisto here. Notice how he already mentioned suits as if this is a foregone conclusion, which I believe it is. Some of the cases we've been involved with multiple, multiple legal issues, uh, very unusual legal issues. Here I think this is analogous in a way in my view, to a suit against a doctor, a suit against an accountant, a suit against a lawyer. These are suits against engineers and, and designers. And I don't think there's any huge legal issues that are, are going to be addressed. These uh, law firms indicated that they would be making their recommendations early August, so in about a month, as to whether they're going to recommend that the state of Rhode Island pursues lawsuits against one or more of these individuals and companies previously involved with the Washington Bridge. And uh, they indicated this press conference that they've had approximately six attorneys and four paralegals that will end up doing over four months worth of work. So if you run the numbers, you're talking about nearly four man years of labor. And if you think that they'll conclude that, you know, really I don't think there's anybody to sue here. Um, I, you know, I think that would be pretty naive. I, I think it's almost certain that they're going to go after people. As you know, in this country, anybody can sue anybody else for practically any reason. And it takes the trial, the proceedings, to ferret out whether somebody was in fact involved with wrongdoing or in this case uh, performed their professional services or construction services in a negligent manner. They're putting people on notice that basically don't destroy any information that you may have in your files regarding the Washington Bridge Project. And this last sentence, you may consider it prudent to notify your insurance carrier of this letter. So I'll explain to you what the implication of that is. If you have professional liability insurance, which engineering consulting firms must have, uh, to perform their services on projects like this, you have what's called a circumstance. And a circumstance is when you have to notify your professional liability insurance carrier that, hey, there's a set of conditions or an event that may trigger a claim. And with professional liability insurance, the coverage is claims-based. So you could have been involved with the project from 15, 20 years ago, and someone today makes a claim Whoever happens to be your professional liability insurer at this point in time would be responsible for defending the claim. Let's say, for example, that the engineering consulting firm didn't report to their professional liability insurance this circumstance. And later on, if they're defending a lawsuit and they go to their insurance company and say, hey, we're getting sued here. And the insurance company says, well, wait a minute, you didn't notify us of a circumstance. And the reason why this is important is professional liability insurers have their own attorneys and the person with the coverage won't have to pay money if the if the insurance company says you know what we're going to engage our own lawyers we'll, we'll pay for outside experts and try and get ahead of this thing to avoid paying out on a big claim down the road so there's really important reasons for why you know these people will need to notify their professional liability insurer and uh, it puts a chilling effect on, on the firms. You know, if you, you've got, this, this insurance isn't cheap. And if you've got a renewal coming up and your 
provider thinks that you may be involved with a major lawsuit, I don't know how that could impact your uh, renewal premiums, but I don't think it would be in a positive fashion. Now, again, this is a statement from Wisto at that press conference yesterday. Absent a startling revelation, which is always possible because we're still reviewing documents, our best judgment is in early August, we will be in a position to definitely recommend whether or not to bring a suit and if so, to whom against? So again, I think that's gonna be a foregone conclusion that they're gonna go after multiple people. I did a video previously talking about, I'd hate to be one of these firms that was involved with inspection of the Washington Bridge. The most recent one that was done before the discovery of the broker and anchor rods, which led to the emergency closure of the bridge was done by AECOM in July of 2023. And they noted that the bridge was in poor condition, that is structurally deficient. Now, I don't know, the details of the contracts that these inspection firms had with Rhode Island DOT. But I think you have to keep an open mind here. I know, I've been involved with projects where you had to do some type of investigation and you were constrained by what the client was willing to pay in terms of gaining access. So for example, I've done vibration monitoring for, for buildings that were gonna be subject to nearby uh, construction activity, which would induce vibrations and we would do a pre-construction, what we call a cosmetic survey to see if there's cracks in the floor slabs and the foundation, in wall finishes, interior, exterior, just to document ahead of time what the condition was in case there's a claim later on. And we'll typically stipulate that our observations are gonna be based on what's readily available. We're not gonna get a man lift out there. We're not gonna scale the side of the building with, uh, with ropes. And uh, I can see in a similar fashion where there's gonna be parts of an existing bridge that are gonna be hard to access. So again, I would be curious as to what Rhode Island DOT specified in terms of available access and what their expectations were for how rigorous these inspections were to be conducted. So as I mentioned back in April, Rhode Island DOT issued this request for proposal and nobody was was biting on this thing. It talks about a maximum of $10 million of incentive pay based on day rates, anywhere from $5,000 to $70,000 per day. So those would be the bonuses, but those would also be the penalties if you ran late and didn't complete the project by the specified date in August of 2026. So not only do you have the potential for these private lawsuits on behalf of the state of Rhode Island against contractors, and engineering consultants who've previously been involved with the Washington Bridge. You also have the US Justice Department who's conducting a fraud investigation and they sent out a demand for documents to Rhode Island DOT in January of 2024. I understand that the state of Rhode Island submitted their information to the Justice Department sometime around March of this year. There's been no further announcement from the Justice Department. Interestingly, the period of document production goes back to 2015, a month after current Rhode Island DOT director, Peter Alviti, uh, started in that role. The period of documentation covers virtually his entire tenure at the DOT as director. Now you might ask yourself, well, why are the feds investigating potential fraud? I don't know specifically, but keep in mind that this damage to the anchor rods, these, these ruptured anchor rods, which led to the emergency closure of the Washington Bridge in mid-December 2023, only got discovered because they were doing ongoing work on the Washington Bridge. And in fact, this is a $78 million contract that started in 2021 and was supposed to be finished in 2026. So you have to ask yourself, if this bridge was basically a basket case and has to be replaced, why were they fixing it up and why weren't they fixing critical things first so we'll see what comes of that investigation if anything it's just another wrinkle to this complicated mess now i want to play a couple of clips i played these before but this was from the initial press conference after rhode island dot announced the emergency closure of the westbound washington bridge in um july the inspection was made, and though the pins that are in question here, the, the anchor uh, rods that are in question here, were in adequate, serviceable shape. Okay, so what he was saying is they discovered these broken anchor rods, but everything was cool per the July 2023 bridge inspection report. 
That's what he's contending here. Uh, once in a while, an extraordinary event will happen, as we, as we, as our engineers are telling us happened in this case. Some kind of outside force that was extraordinary, over and above the normal use of everyday use of the bridge, happened between July and now. That's the best information that they have that they're giving to me that I'm passing to you right now. And as I indicated in my previous videos, I thought that was an utter crock. I mean, this is the director of the DOT for Rhode Island, and he's a degreed engineer according to his LinkedIn profile. And he's basically saying he's just taking information that's fed to him, and he's not essentially being skeptical whatsoever. I mean, this press conference was a few days after they discovered these broken anchor rods. So how they could have ascertained that there was some extraordinary event that caused the rupture of these rods. And later on, he goes on to basically speculate that it was a heavily loaded truck that went over unnoticed and did all this damage. So to me, the extraordinary event here is that Director Alvidi still has his position there at Rhode Island DOT. And the other thing I pointed out early on, this is a photo of the broken anchor rod. And right after the emergency closure of this bridge, Alvidi trots out this photo, which is intended to show that back in the July 2023 inspection, this anchor rod wasn't broken. And I remember looking at the time thinking, you know, these are completely different viewing angles of this rod location. And in fact, the left photo is from the 2023 inspection and you cannot see the portion of the anchor rod in question. It's, it's much lower down as you can see on the right. So again, I feel for the people of Rhode Island. I hope uh, somehow this project can get back on track, but uh, it's gonna be years and years and years before a replacement is going to come for this bridge, I think, based on what I've seen here so far. Which is interesting because the westbound bridge carries over 100,000 vehicles a day. And this is about three times the traffic volume of the Francis Scott Key Bridge that collapsed earlier this year. And the federal government's announced that they're willing to pay whatever, you know, they're throwing around a cost of about $2 billion to replace the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And so far there's been some, uh, indications of support from the federal government, but not the full-throated, yeah, we've got you, get this done sort of thing that they got for the key bridge, which from a big picture standpoint, I think the Washington Bridge uh, should be a higher priority over the Francis Scott Key Bridge in terms of replacement. So I'd like to send a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your ongoing support. I also wanna send a shout out to those of you who've provided super thanks. That's another great way to support the channel. Check out the links in the description. I have links to these various news sources. I also have links for free digital downloads for the biggest civil engineering disasters for the past 100 years. I also have a download involving the Artemis project that NASA has going on to return humans to the surface of the moon. So check that out and please stay tuned for future videos.